Hello, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to today's session in our ongoing Hydro Plus series. My name is Elizabeth Ingram. I'm the content director for Clarion Energy. This session is produced by the Hydro Review website and High Division International, and is sponsored by Hydro Component Systems and Mesa Associates. Before we begin the presentation, I need to go over a few housekeeping items to give you the best experience. First, we recommend that you shut down any applications that don't need to be running in the background for better performance, and so you can concentrate on this presentation. At the bottom of the screen, you will see a toolbar with a Q&A button. Please use this to ask questions for the speakers or to ask for help from our support team if you have technical issues. We'll be monitoring the questions as they come in, so please feel free to send them at any time throughout the discussion. You can also use this webcast platform to network with attendees as well as the speakers in this session. We encourage you to explore it at your leisure once this presentation has concluded or at any time that's convenient for you. You can connect with our partners and other attendees by clicking on the interested button on their profile. And that's it for the housekeeping, so we'll get started with this session. Today's session is operations and maintenance, condition-based maintenance, fix and to break, not. For this interactive session, experts will present information on the implementation and use of condition-based maintenance monitoring systems and analysis tools for hydroelectric facilities. Methods of data analysis and reduction also will be discussed. And now I want to introduce the moderator for today's session. Mike Peterson is the Director of Operations for Kakana Utilities, a municipal utility near Green Bay, Wisconsin in the US. Kakana operates 19 low head hydro units at seven dams, five of which are located at US Army Corps of Engineers dams and two gas turbines. He's responsible for generation, major project construction, licensing, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources regulations and compliance, the electric distribution system, the water distribution system, substations, metering, and the operations center, which is managed 24 seven. Mike has presented papers, participated in panel discussions, and chaired sessions at Paragen International, High Division International, the National Hydro Power Association, and the Midwest Hydro Users Group. He is also a member of numerous committees within, a, within NHA, the Midwest Hydro Users Group, and Hydrovision, and has served in numerous positions at the Midwest Hydro Users Group, including past president. So Mike, I'm gonna turn the session over to you. Thanks so much. Elizabeth, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. And first of all, I wanna thank all of you for attending, and I wanna thank our speakers for taking the time out of their busy schedules as well. I think you're gonna really enjoy our session today. Uh, we've got two excellent speakers. Uh, presentations today will be on the implementation and use of condition-based maintenance uh, management, monitoring. Um, and after this, each speaker is completed, we'll have a couple of minutes for a few quick questions. And then after that, at the end of the session, we'll have uh, about 15, 20 minutes for questions for either speaker at that time. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Igor. Igor is a professional specialist engineer with 30 years of experience in electrical, industrial, and marine engineering. He is, a he is registered with the Engineers and Geoscientists Association of the po Providence of British Columbia since 2001. He is a member of the Standards Council of Canada, IEC, TC2 Rotating Machinery Committee, and IEEE Association and its Hydraulic Hydroelectric Subcommittee Working Group for IEEE Standards, Development for Hydro Generation Auxiliary Systems. Igor joined BC Hydro in October of 2000 and is providing services, including rotating equipment design, maintenance, commissioning, diagnostics, testing, repairs, failure investigation and analysis, equipment inspections and health rating assessments, maintenance programs and reviews, specifications and maintenance instructions and development, cost estimates, and he's also, also offers ex expertise related to generators, transformers, circuit breakers, disconnect switches, isophase bus, gas insulated switch gear, terminal equipment and arc flash and grounding. So at this time, we welcome Igor on his presentation of, um, his presentation today is confirmation of high particle discharge and Corona probe readings on a large hydro generator. And thank you, Igor, and the floor is yours, sir. 
Uh, hello, everyone. Um, can you see my screen? Uh, thank you, Mike, for, pre uh, for uh, presenting me. Uh, I'm going to present uh, this topic, uh, confirmation on high partial discharge and uh, corona prop readings on a large hydro generator. Um, it's very important for us. So we are doing a lot of testing and investigation, and I'll actually present two uh, case studies that um, may help um, you to realize what we do and how that studies can help us to maintain our, our equipment. So that's kind of, let's start from the very beginning, just a bit of theory about the partial discharge, why it's occurring and where. This nice slide can show you a nice turkey, fresh, and down below it shows like a cooked one. And to the right, you can see the piece of bar, Robel bar, just for comparison. You can compare the color on there like, uh, I, I didn't put the, um, a new, a bar, uh, just section, just uh, um, aged one. So you can see the color of uh, the ground wall and the cooked turkey. But on the very top, it, 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 it has a fresh. So imagine that if you poke uh, uh, that fresh turkey meat with a finger, it will spring back. It's kind of possesses like a elastic properties, not plastic. But when we put the turkey in the oven, so it's when it starts cooking, the tissue becomes softer, uh, some kind of air pockets develop inside, and if you poke it, then it will not spring back. So, and what is it, what's actual moisture in evaporates, meat cooks, and uh, some cavities uh, um, uh, occurring inside. So that's why when when you when you poke it, it will not spring back. So that's kind of uh, analogy. If you put a piece of insulate uh, um, a bar inside the oven and heat it up. Like in uh, some in, over the some time we we can smell the, um, the epoxy right and it evaporates and um, that's a kind of epoxy is replaced by by air or, or surrounding gas and uh, then um, when uh, that piece of uh, conductor um, is in service like the bar is in service uh, so and we have a voltage stress. Um, so partial discharge is occurring. That's, uh, that's kind of slide shows you insulator uh, um, on one side and another side and a piece of copper conductor. So when the voltage stress is enough, let's say if it's in a gas in air, it's three kV per millimeter, uh, that, that void breaks down and like tiny sparky is occurring there. And what we do, we have a PD coupler here, just down below 80 picofarad coupler, let's say. And at 60 hertz, it does kind of like an all, almost like an open switch, right? But at a very high frequency where the spark is propagating, PD couple allows that uh, um, it goes to uh, the PD monitoring system and we record um, a partial discharge. So that's a general picture that we see. It's not related to exactly these particular uh, two case studies, but in general that we see the end uh, winding and uh, that interface between their semiconducting paint and gradient paint. And that when that interface is broken, that kind of uh, like what we see and uh, ozone is generated and uh, this kind of signs of white powder, this is signs of ozone byproduct. So that's a like, like very quick one. So that's um, the, what they show the interface between the semiconductive and the, um, the gradient paint is shown on that picture. And the main thing is to keep it <clears throat> like not damaged. As soon as that interface is damaged, we may see uh, um, uh, the damage on the surface. And this is kind of experiment was done in the lab. It was intentionally that interface was damaged like two, like two centimeter damage. And we see um, that um, sustained corona glow at this location, damaging installation further. And in general, um, what um, when we do partial discharge, we are looking at the trends and uh, looking if it's not doubling in six months, if it is, so we raise the flag. And also we look at the polarity predominance on there as a positive and negative. And um, especially when we have um, multi-tone coils, so we, we look at the negative predominance. Yeah, because if it's like one and uh, 1.5 and high, it means that partial discharge is occurring mostly on the copper conductor to ground wall interface, where there is a term like dedicated tone insulation. And, uh, um, that may be damaged and uh, it will be a failure. So in general, PD is symptom of the failure mechanism, right? And high PD, we raise the flag and we investigate. So that's what kind of um, equipment that we use uh, to uh, continuous on monitoring. So this one in particular is HydroTech 2, it's Iris uh, power equipment. Um, we use it on this particular um, unit that uh, the case study is going on. 
Of course, we also use different uh, like um, uh, later models, higher uh, guards uh, two and two plus. But this is what we, are to, we what we're using at that particular station. So, so the first case study is so one of our um, units. It's at uh, GMS power facility. That's uh, a voltage class is 13.8 kV, and um, the rated power was 321. A bit of history of that machine. It was kind of replaced, like the stereo was replaced, and um, the rotor for leg frame was rehabilitated in 2007. Um, the unit is a bit derated because it uh, did, like hydrogen uh, thermal equipment and the winding that we have, it's epoxy mica class F. So uh, as we discussed, we use continuous line monitor and we feed the data from the continuous line monitor registers directly to our PI process book that would allow us to kind of visualize um, what's going on. And we see, you can see we have magnitudes of partial discharge activity, NQNs and QMs. And in this particular case, it was quite high, like 590 is almost 600. So, and um, we, of course, we maintain our database. We're comparing these numbers with the previous test results. We keep the trend and uh, we use Iris database as a uh, reference as well. And for this particular class of machine, it's 13.8 kV machine. You can um, look here. And the levels that we have around 600, they are over 90 percentile. And 90 percentile is kind of, uh, um, this, uh, the benchmark, right? When we say, oh, it's more than 90 percentile, we have like really raised the flag and perform more investigation. Um, that's the trend that, uh, that we keep. And uh, you may look at the very beginning, the PD levels was high and then we stabilized, but, but keeping high, like around 600, uh, a long time high. And as soon as it starts climbing up, we raise the flag and start investigation. So that's kind of winding diagram. And um, it's not kind of vertical, this is horizontal because we have quite a lot of bars and we go like from left to right and we have three phases, A, B and C. So, and each phase has six circuit. And when we did partial discharge testing, we determined that the, the, let's say those particular circuits has a higher level of partial discharge activity. And um, I, on my slide, I just um, uh, rectangle them in red you may see the 397 millivolts and 400 to like 28 and down below, like pretty high, right? So, but without uh, without uh, um, uh, doing corona probe test at that particular moment, we don't know what actually, uh, we know the circuit where PD is high, but we don't know what bar caused that kind of high PD. Also we did like visual inspection and this winding, it's interesting thing that we did find uh, the washer in between two bars and that's um, high voltage bars. And I can show you the next slide. So, and that washer is kind of has signs of burning marks, right? That's, we, we expect that it was also, uh, that's uh, um, high voltage in between these two bars uh, of different phase kind of contributed to that kind of our overheating. So let's say that that washer was, um, that bar was uh, 245 on the top, top bar and 245 on the bottom. Even if the voltage phase to ground, let's say for the top bar is 5.65 kV and on the bottom is 5.06, almost the same, but the voltage in between two bars, it's much higher. It's kind of 9.3 kV because we can calculate it using cosine law, right? And calculate the voltage between adjacent bars. So that's um, uh, in order to pinpoint what bar in the circuit gives us that high PD readings, we perform corona probe test. So let's set up for corona probe testing equipment. We have uh, two transformers connected in parallel and we have cable reactor to tune it. And it, it was interesting, um, yeah, because these two transformers, they, 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 then when they work in parallel, so they share the load, right? And uh, impedance of one transformer was a bit higher. So it took a bit more load, but it was right on. So that's just uh, um, my recollection that we spent some time to tune it. So this is a kind of um, the barrier that we put between the testing and um, stereo core. And idea is to swipe, you see that uh, uh, the personal uh, took uh, the hot stick, we mount, we mount a TVA probe on it and uh, we swipe the slot go from the uh, top to the bottom. Then how we can read on the screen, on the meter, we can read the milliamps and judge uh, which bar has more um, uh, activity than others. So we did plot the data and look, um, actually uh, we have acceptance criteria. It depends on the winding. 
if it's asphalt, polyester, or epoxy, it's different kind of uh, acceptance criteria. So in our case, it's epoxy mica. We want to see here below 20 milliamps, right? If you see below, we are fine. But if you see above, then it's kind of concerned. But in this particular case, you may see that it's very, very low uh, um, numbers, like 2.2, 0 0.3, and so on. In this case, uh, it's kind of was a dilemma. Uh, okay, we have high PD readings on uh, on the PDA4 instrument, but quite low on the um, Corona probe. A few plots I can show you just for reference. So it's a, a kind of clear slot partial discharge, right? And it's kind of this very high um, positive predominance kind of that suggests that it's on the surface of the machine, but uh, it wasn't consistently uh, the same. It was up and down, up and down. That's kind of um, uh, difficult to uh, investigate when uh, it changes very often. So this, uh, this is again like slot PD on the surface with very low magnitude. It was done at nine kV, it was offline test. We did compare offline and online to, to investigate. Then we plot the data and in this way that we can see the trend perfectly. At the very beginning, it was high and then it goes down, down, down for some seconds, but for some seconds, it, it was opposite. It was nothing and then I jumped high. So our task was just um, to uh, find out if we need to pull any bars for dissection and further investigation. And at that, but for that particular machine decision was made, let's not uh, pull the bar from that machine. We have a much better candidate and um, over the time we will monitor activity on this particular machine. And uh, um, then we can decide which bar to pull. But most interesting case is this one. It was one on our uh, reverse stock units and we did this, like similar investigation. It's a higher um, voltage level machine, it's 16 kV and it's 1984. And uh, um, uh, we, we did uh, do a lot of testing in the past and this one was very interesting. The trend was uh, kind of steady, but high. It, it was like thousand, thousand like millivolts, 600,000. But when it starts skyrocketing, we decided and with the help of the management uh, to pull the bars, right? So that's kind of a continuous unmonitored data. You see the numbers were like uh, 3,000, uh, 2,700, 3,000, 4,125 millivolts, QM. That's kind of compared to their IRIS database. You see it's kind of, Level of concern is 500, but we are like five times higher. So that's why we decided to take actions. And actually we raised the flag um, uh, and raising the flag means increasing frequency of partial discharge testing, monitoring, and probably conduct the specialized testing that we have done. Uh, a few plots to show you, we did offline tests and we did online tests. Offline tests allow us to make sure that we don't have noise, right? Because we disconnect during the terminals from the ISFS bus but we still have a very, very clear picture. No noise, but partial discharge on the plots. So let's zoom in. You see this kind of from the book, almost from, like from the book. Look at the QM levels and they're so high, right? And, uh, but they were changing e even higher. That's the same like 3D uh, like trend chart. So that's uh, that machine with the rotor out. We got um, um, okay to pull the bars, right? So rotor is out and uh, this kind of view of the winding. And you may notice that like slide on uh, the top left, it shows um, the bars progressing from a light, uh, left to right and on the down below from, again, from left to right. So this is wave wound machine. And kind of the trick with wave wound machine that if you need to pull the back bars uh, for the reason of, let's say we need to uh, replace the bar because of the failure or do repairs, um, we need to pull a lot of front bars. In this case, kind of for that machine, in order to pull one back bar, we need to pull 19 front bars. It's exact number, 19, that's kind of a lot of work. And so at this moment, at that time, we were allowed only to pull the front bars, right? And so that's kind of test set up. We have 250 kVA transformer uh, with sphere gaps, with everything, with cable reactor to tune it. So we did energize the winding to the face to ground voltage and uh, using a, a bit higher face to ground, it's, in, it's uh, uh, 8 kV uh, um, and we did a bit higher to compensate for the temperature and we did swipe it, right? Oh, sorry, this is 16 kV machine, sorry. And uh, we go to 10 kV because uh, face to ground is 9.2. So we did go along the slot, every slot actually probing every slot. And I show you that quick uh, kind of picture that um, uh, every phase 
and it's a bar number and milliamps reading. And, and you may notice that it's very high, like 120 milliamps compared to acceptable 20, less than 20. Other phase is even higher, like from 140 to 200. And phase C was 130 milliamps. So that did tell us that we have a problem. So we did pull six bars and uh, sent uh, plus one spur extended to our power tech lab for testing and, and dissection. This is a nice setup that we have in PowerTech lab, right? It's got every bar is tested on the stand, equipment connected. And uh, let's say this is there just a close um, up view. It's kind of guarded uh, to do the power factor and partial stress testing. And especially here, let's say we guard uh, that portion of the bar that is kind of gradient uh, area, right? And so also we did test PD couplers that we were using. There were 100 equivalent couplers. And the main idea was to see if couplers themselves are PD free. And it's good testing was done at PowerTech and we determined that uh, PD inception voltage is, uh, is higher than operating voltage. And then let's say uh, 8, 8 kV to ground and inception voltage was 16 kV, like 15.5 and 12 kV for this couplers. Couplers were fine. So we confirmed that it's not the coupler that may show us uh, the bad readings. So, PowerTech lab, they did nice testing for us, uh, like testing service resistivity. And based on this slide, uh, comparing spare bars that we sent to PowerTech and, uh, and bars and service. And you can notice that like the levels, this is particular service resistivity on the spare bars are much higher than on their bars and service. And, and that does make sense because the bars and service, they lost a bit of uh, semiconductive paint on, 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 on the, on, uh, that covers their slot portion. So also PD testing was done. And you may notice that QMAX on their bars that in service are like 2766, right? Compared to the spare bar that is very low, 9629. That does give us an idea that, wow, that's kind of a partial discharge really going on here. So that's the trend of there. This is um, um, dissipation fractal test and, and tip up. We did do it at, at uh, different voltages. And it did confirm that the spare bars show much lower pop, like dissipation factor anti pop. So that's set up for swap. We also perform voltage endurance test based on IEEE 1553, the schedule A, like 400 hours for 35 kV, and maintain the temperature 90 degrees as a kind of high separating temperature provided by site. And at the very, very end, we did breakdown test, and we were actually surprised. So um, at PowerTech, uh, it, it was done, put in the oil bath and increase the voltage until the bar fails and it really fails at a very high level, like 51 kVAC. Imagine that this is already like 35 at the time machine. Uh, it did go through the voltage endurance, additional aging test, and then it did survive like 51 kVAC. So that's kind of close a view for that interface between the grading and semicon. It's kind of, you can see that powder is very deteriorated. So that's a nice setup in the PowerTech lab. We have six bars and one spare. They were actually uh, measured and um, coin tap tested. And uh, we don't need to be musician just to, to hear the hollow sound along the bar. And we selected the area for the section, mostly in those that gave us uh, that hollow sound, right? That's going to, uh, yeah, yeah, due to delamination in um, the ground wall. So that's uh, samples were cut nicely. And then uh, um, they were uh, uh, like epoxy, uh, yeah, sorry, mica tape was peeled off. And we did see the progress in the very beginning, uh, like in their um, first layers, almost to the mid of the ground wall, uh, the mica tape was clear. No any signs of damage by partial discharge, but coming closer to the copper conductor. And that was suggested by partial discharge testing we had on um, these bars, very high negative polarity predominance that does suggest PD is occurring close to the like to the copper. We see like a coffee spill, right? You see that's kind of very uh, um, noticeable signs of partial discharge. So that's comparison between the spare bar, uh, the section spare bar and the service H bar. And uh, of course the, um, the spare bar was clean and nice. And uh, uh, the bar that was in service that kind of, um, uh, appearance of um, the mica tape. So you may see pretty closer to the copper strand. That's a picture to the left corner. Exactly, copper spill and, um, and peeling it more, it's kind of more pronounced. And you may notice that kind of signs of partial discharge here as well. 
mid slot it was fine uh, until we hit the mid slot and closer to the copper then what we see all the damage and you, you may also notice the debonding it's uh, it's like a, a, it's almost like accordion right shape and uh, um, this uh, for example that particular bar number 615 did experience 120 milliamps corona prop test right and that's kind of confirmed that at that high level of uh, corona probe, um, uh, we do have damage uh, accredited by partial discharge. That's microscope that um, Povatech uses to evaluate um, the condition of um, the installation. It's um, a very good um, magnification and uh, we can see everything and measure um, the size, um, if we have a tape folds and so, and this one, let's pick just one, one of the slides that showed delamination, like um, it's actually separation uh, of adjustment insulation layers, right? It's not good bonding anymore yet, yeah, because epoxy is gone. Uh, so copper to ground PD, nice picture here, a lot of damage, right? And we even see kind of imprints of the strands that confirm that it was closer to the copper. And um, of course we can see carbonized tracking as well. That's kind of tree, uh, um, that's um, characteristic uh, appearance of, of that um, carbonization. And when we did um, breakdown test, uh, the bar failed and you may see that it fails in corner where um, the most stress is in the corner. Unlikely it may fail somewhere in the middle, but um, most ex expected failure location is, is, is the corner. And um, in many cases, um, it didn't. So if the bar fails, let's say in one location, it doesn't go straight line and uh, uh, goes out uh, at the same, like on their uh, straight line. It it's can move, laterally move, right? And uh, in this case, uh, it finds their a high, a short, shortest path, but uh, if epoxy is not intact in, uh, in, into heat, it, it finds the path where it, Epoxy is kind of deteriorated, and uh, that kind of breakdown was here. So I think that that's um, about it. And if you have any questions, please uh, jump in. Uh, Igor, thank you very much for that fine presentation. And we do have a few questions. Uh, just to ask a couple quickly now, and then, or one now, and then I'll wait till the end of. Um, Ozern's presentation, we ask some more. But one question that came in is one of the slides showed the stator winding with end winding blocking. Did this machine experience partial discharge related issues when those blockings were contaminated? Um, I think that blocking uh, was uh, at um, Revelstock uh, station here. So that blocking, that's kind of supports the end uh, uh, winding, right? Uh, just because winding is a lot of forces and they're almost like um, proportional to the current squared, right? Higher the load, higher the forces. So that's blocking sort of the purpose of restricting winding from movement. But at the same time, um, that's related to that question. It may provide, if winding is contaminated, we have a kind of bridge if you can see my cursor on the um, bottom um, um, right uh, slide, right? Um, so it's kind of, if you have contamination, it kind of bridges one bar to adjacent bar through that blocking. And um, it's, high, yeah, because of high voltage, because of the coupling uh, um, capacitance between the conductor, copper conductor and the surface uh, of their um, contamination. So that kind of, contamination is under the uh, very high voltage, uh, same voltage as the copper conductor says. And if you have this contaminated area in between two bars, especially if they are diff of different phases, we have a, a kind of current pass between two, right? And, uh, that's, um, and it's not consistent in terms of the voltage stress here. It can be very high and uh, create a partial discharge, like ionize the air around it. And it's kind of effect um, affect that ionizing air, affect um, uh, the underlying uh, epoxy resin. That's that's deteriorate as well. So it means that contamination can kind of serve um, a bad purpose. So it's it's better to to make sure that it's clean. But um, yeah, we, we did have experience with this on the on that particular machine. Even when we do PI test or DCRM test, we can see that contamination. Very good. 
Well, thank you very much, Igor. Um, just hang on. I'm sure there'll be more questions after the next presentation. Um, our next speaker uh, is Ozrin, and he's a master of science at the Department of Physics, faculty of science lab in Zagreb. He's worked four years as an assistant at the Department of Physics involved in the experimental laboratory research on superconductivity. In 20, 2006, Ozrin has been, since 2006, excuse me, Ozrin has been employed by Vesky on software development, vibration troubleshooting, and problem solving. Ozrin has worked on numerous machine condition monitoring projects as system commissioning engineer and as a technical expert for machine conditioning and evaluation. Ozrin today is going to present a paper uh, presentation on Renaissance-related problem, diagnostics, and solution proposal on vertical Francis hydro generators. Thank you, Osrin, and please uh, continue. Thank you very much for a nice introduction, Mike. And I want to thank the organizer <clears throat> for giving us, me, the opportunity to talk a little bit about what we do. And I wanted to start this presentation by saying that I hope it will kind of resonate with you because that's usually a good thing when something resonates with you. But since it's about resonance issues, which is the enemy in this case, it might be best to, it, it might not be the best choice of words. But anyway, on behalf of all of the co authors, beside me, there is Ozan Reshkovich, also working with uh, Veski Limited, and uh, Mr. John Little from Iris Power Collateral. I will briefly give you a presentation of an interesting topic uh, in the problem diagnostic solution kind of manner. So you can kind of see how we went. We, we didn't, the path was not always straightforward. We took a, little, a bit of uh, 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 turns in the wrong directions, but it eventually we figured out what's going on and, and the machine, or should I say machines are actually working uh, very well. Okay, here is the uh, little bit of history and the unit layout. So it's basically a newly uh, conditioned uh, uh, power plant, which has two, uh, I wouldn't say small, but five megawatt in some parts of the world. It might be small at some parts of the world, it might not be. So it's five, uh, two uh, five megawatt units powered by uh, Francis Turbine. Uh, and uh, what was interesting to me, uh, I did not see such a large unit uh, uh, being uh, uh, having a rolling element elements bearings. So it is a, a ball bearing and uh, uh, the upper bearing was actually uh, so the axial and radial. So it's about here and there is the radial bearing around here. So this is the generator. And from day one, it experienced problems. Uh, when you would start the unit, it will kind of behave as if it was going through critical speed. It was kind of behaving more, more like a turbo than a, than a, than a hydro. And another thing which gave us headaches was also, and uh, which gave the guys commissioning the unit headaches was also that the, the vibrations would come and go, so to speak, without obvious cause. At the end, we did manage to find out what this was, but it, they would come intermittently uh, and they would uh, just rise up. And then after half an hour, one hour, three hours, they would go down to, uh, to normal value, so to speak. <clears throat> What we measured, uh, what uh, uh, two main directions of measurements were direction X, it was here. And actually there were already installed the vibration sensors. So accelerometers in this direction and in this right direction uh, to kind of uh, give the guys uh, alarms and trips into the SCADA system, uh, which, which was their main purpose. And besides them, and these cables are actually from our measurement equipment. These original legs and I will, uh, uh, these are those legs. Sorry, were not originally uh, put, but they were put later uh, to try and stiffen the unit up to to reduce the problems. But we'll get to that. We'll talk about these legs uh, for a couple of times in the, during the presentation. <clears throat> so, as I said, the main the nominal rotational frequency for the unit was twelve point five hertz. When we first got there, uh, we noticed, and I will back that up with a couple of trends of uh, data. We, uh, we noticed that there are differences in thermal expansion of uh, rotor and stator. We basically used three types of sensors to try and capture the problem. One was the 
TRG sensor called here, which is actually a diagnostic trigger sensor, which basically is this guy here giving you one pulse per revolution, enabling you to calculate the RPM, enabling you to, to do all of all, uh, order analysis, etc. Then, and you might wonder maybe why would someone want to use the guys, especially here who are measuring and vibrations, we might wonder why, why would you use a, a proximity probe or relative vibration probe when it's a ball bearing unit, but it turned out that these guys were very valuable and I will show you later how. There are for examples are given here. So this section here is actually measurement uh, of axial and radial uh, vibrations on the flywheel. So on this particular part of the generator. <clears throat> and uh, then we used obviously the uh, accelerometers which we put on the, on the, uh, on the, on the generator housing. And from what we figured out first, uh, looking at the data, our first sus suspect was uh, the ball, the lower guy, uh, the lower guide bearing, so to, so, so to speak, so, to, so the lower uh, ball bearing, because we noticed uh, as the uh, unit heats up and goes down that the the axial movement, so the relative movement of rotor to stutter is kind of related to that intermittently high vibration uh, path. And two frequencies of interest were noticed. One was the nominal frequency, which had usually the largest response, but not always as we saw later. But at, anyway, at this time we came at this measurement campaign, we didn't see that the natural frequency occurring, which was at 10 Hertz, which is the one through which the unit passes upon the run up and obviously run down. It was always smaller uh, uh, at least during the, these measurements. <clears throat> and these graphs, so the upper graphs and the lower graphs show you, uh, the upper graphs show you trends of uh, uh, measurement of uh, data from, so it's basically RMS value uh, of the vibration levels from the accelerometers. And there were several startups and rundowns that you can see. And then there I've noticed, I've uh, circled or I've squared the uh, interesting portions, which we'll come to analyze in a bit of more detail. One is here that with temperature at the same, actually at the same uh, uh, regime, the vibrations have increased uh, suddenly without obvious choice. And then they started increasing more and more. And this one is obviously t uh, temperature related as you can, uh, as, because uh, uh, after this jump, uh, no other parameters was actually changed. So this is temperature related. And then we saw also here in this area that also in the same regime, the vibrations were increasing and then going down and increasing and then going down. So what is the what is the uh, uh, point uh, I'm trying to uh, make and how is this relating to the axial movement? This sensor here is actually pointing in axial direction to the flywheel. And this red line is actually showing you the distance from the sensor tip. And at this particular point in time, uh, the meaning of this axial displacement is actually how much the because the unit starts hitting up, the stutter will want to expand in, in, in mostly in the vertical directions. And also the rotor will uh, try to get expand relative to the axial radial bearing. And this sensor is actually giving you uh, by how much the, there is a relative uh, uh, expansion between the stator and rotor. So as you can see here, and it was quite a lot, it is 0.7 millimeter. And we noticed when it started switching sides that then it was at that point that the intermittently high vibrations uh, uh, arose, but still they were kind of, so let's say acceptance levels, level was about, let's say 2.5 millimeter. So it's still, it, it, it did cross, but not but too much. So we kind of figured out doing the measurements that if we focus now on this area here, that if this is definitely, uh, 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 so we could not answer immediately about, why would vibration suddenly increase? But we could figure out what's going on with the temperature. What we figured out, and you, you can see on this on this slide too, in the cold state, you would have one natural frequency, so one critical speed, so to speak, when the unit was going up. And when the unit was heated up at some temperature, it was a different. So this was an example of a run down from uh, 750, which is the nominal speed and going down. What these legs were actually doing they were 
increasing the natural frequency in this direction. And so more response was visible on nominal frequency. That was our conclusion. And we said, okay, the guys before us who put the legs there were wrong and we have to unscrew, unscrew them from the, from the body of the generator, which will remove the uh, uh, natural frequency down to approximately six, uh, uh, 10 Hertz area. And uh, uh, then it, there will be no change with the temperature. And we were hoping, okay, th this might be the solution to the problem. We're going to just balance the unit and that's it. And we were wrong. So the problem actually was not uh, in the, in the uh, uh, bearing area. We talked to the manufacturer. Uh, he confirmed that it is not actually a shrink, shrink fitted uh, uh, bearing type, but it's, uh, it has a, a soft, uh, uh, a connection to the housing so it was able to slide up and down because we were thinking if this uh, axial displacement uh, uh, of uh, a large axial displacement pushes on the ball bearings then suddenly something can uh, uh, you know uh, uh, like bump the generator and that's why we see these these increases in vibrations but it was not the case as conferred by the by the manufacturer uh, uh, of the unit and anyway during the whole time we were there, uh, we did not see uh, the vibration level going extremely high. But when we got back and uh, from those sensors leading to the SCADA systems, the guy said, unfortunately, that the problem was not solved, that the unit experienced the, the more and more uh, vibration, vibrations and, uh, and uh, they sometimes stop. The, it can be calm for days and then they increase more and more. And then we had to think of a different, when you have to, had to thought of a different approach, which we try to do uh, uh, with, uh, again, using these uh, uh, legs, but now unscrewed from the body. You don't see any screws here. So it's, this leg is actually not touching the generator, the generator flange. So this is the flange between the generator and the, and the, and the, and the turbine uh, pedestal. It was not touching it. We measured uh, that there were more vibrations on the leg, uh, just to prove that it's not gonna uh, that it can be uh, treated as a foundation. And then we put one sensor looking at the flange here, and one sensor putting uh, looking at the flange here. So those are proximity probes. And the first thing we did, so we connected that. So those those were uh, sorry, those were uh, placed on four legs. There is four of these legs around the generator at ninety degrees. And also what we did, and this, as you can see, these legs are here. So these are the sensors. And we also put four accelerometers uh, below uh, on the connection between the pedestal and, and, uh, and, uh, and the spiral. So in this area here. And these four sensors in the XL measuring the displacement and four sensors in the XL measuring accelerations were turned out to be very Valuable. So instead of going looking at the radial the direction, we focused more into the axial one. So there is a zoom in picture of the uh, of the sensor, and these are just some additional measurements in the turbine cover. <clears throat> what we found out when uh, we when there was nothing more but to uh, you know uh, put the water inside the spiral was actually that there is a. Uh, so this is water coming into the spiral. And since the spiral, uh, since the, the whole of the generator is being founded on the spiral, you could actually see very large and not and asymmetrical movements on, on all of the legs. In a few measurements we did, they were never the same. So it kind of, it lifts up and it lifts up quite a lot. In this measurement, 160 microns for leg one, 80 microns for leg three. But it's it's asymmetrical and uh, also uh, different starts uh, uh, meant different numbers too. So this was our first conclusion that there was something long, wrong with the foundation of of this unit. The second conclusion, and there was actually a questioning of whether or not it might be okay. It's not bearing related. Then it, could it be pedestal related? We were thinking maybe this is not stiff enough, so it's kind of flexing its way. What we did was we used sensors here and sensors on the opposite side. So there is four of them. So four of the accelerometers. But we found out that they are out of phase with one another. And what we tried to do is project of how much the top part of the generator would be flexing in the radial direction if, if this pedestal was stiff. And what we found out, what we calculated was 
around six millimeters per second compared to seven millimeters per second, which was measured. It was pretty uh, uh, obvious that the pedestal is stiff enough. It's not uh, flexing, at least not flexing very much. So it's not the issue. This kind of led us to the conclusion that the problem is somewhere below the spiral because first of all, those numbers are quite high. You would not want for a generator for when it, a generator foundation to basically not vibrate. So I don't know if there is any like uh, uh, standard criteria for that. I don't think so, but you should expect numbers. You would want them to be around zero and it's 0 0.8 millimeters per second on this side and one millimeters per second. So it's quite a lot. So that's what uh, we concluded. There is a problem actually. So below this line here, and our proposition was that we should do one of the two things. So one was, let's say, cheaper or easier to do actually. This is a proposition one, inject liquid concrete under pressure between the spiral and the diffuser. And also add, I forgot to have it here, but it's later in the slides. And also add the anchoring elements to kind of in increase the stiffness. And maybe the uh, second proposal was uh, build a new pedestal so that the whole generator is not founded on the spiral, but it should be found, founded somewhere here. We decided to, uh, or actually the guys doing the commissioning who were responsible for everything, decided to go with number one and see if it worked. And if it was able to increase the critical uh, speed or the natural frequency above some reasonable number, like 15, 16 Hertz, then they would stop there and if the levels of vibrations are around below 2.5 millimeter per second then they would stop there what they found out during the investigation when this disassembled everything was that these areas of the uh, 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 of the connection between the spiral and the uh, uh, concrete was very weak very bad and then uh, uh, they had to inject like 0.3 meter square concrete into this area. This area was good, but uh, additional anchoring elements were also uh, added. And uh, then we uh, performed measurements after the works were done. I'm, I'm talking now about unit two actually, and there are two of these units. So unit ones had similar issues. I don't remember the, the, the exact amount of uh, concrete poured there, but it was also a lot. After they finished with the work, we were uh, we came there for commissioning and we thought, okay, we didn't see that 10 Hertz anymore. So it was somewhere above, I will show you exactly where. And we balanced the machine. So these were the upper guide bearings, lower guide bearings, and uh, uh, acceleration sensor. So this is the vibrational velocity. And we were, you know, playing with the mechanical uh, 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 first with the mechanical uh, regime, mechanical operation regime, so no excitation or anything. And we were able to bring numbers down, and we were kind of you know, happy already, <laughs> starting to you know crack beers and everything. We were glad that the numbers were were uh, very low, but there was one additional problem we uh, which was actually not related to the foundation but to the rotor. When we turned on the excitation, you can see here. The numbers started to increase again, and then we had to, you know, make a compromise with, with balancing uh, uh, for uh, for to be good in mechanical versus to be good in uh, when excited. We were able to do that, and kind of the final test was to uh, reject the unit from low that uh, in this case three megawatts. As you can see, it did pass. Through the critical uh, uh, speed, but which was on a very on a higher number. So when it goes to when it runs up, there is no passage, and the run ups, and then it goes and shut down, there is no passage. So this was above definitely the the the, the nominal speed, and below the uh, 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 runaway speed, which is also important. So this is basically the the most interesting uh, and one of the things I forgot to mention even it, when it ramps up it's going fast so the vibrations usually don't have time to develop. Uh, on this slide it was a situation uh, when we first came so when the critical speed was very low below nominal speed and with this stiffening and injecting uh, concrete we were able to increase it to approximately 885 rpm which was you know good enough for the for the uh, for the unit to uh, run at. So this is a summary. The problem origin was that uh, there was a 
problem in the spiral foundation, which was inadequate, and the uh, unit uh, would be excited on its natural frequency, which we figure out to be also by doing a bump test. What we did, what we suggested to do finally was to inject concrete below the spiral under pressure that add additional anchoring element and again we i forgot to mention we, we first unscrewed those stiff those legs those four legs around the generator but then then since we were we wanted to increase more and more the uh, the natural frequency now we were used them again so it was basically anchoring element concrete injection and stiffening legs were used and it moved to around 50 hertz area so there will be a small resonance effect when the unit rejects in at 2.5 megawatt but the critical speed is now between high speed obtainable from load rejection and runaway speed. And it was applied to another unit, so to the second unit also uh, with, uh, with good results. So that's basically my presentation. I hope I didn't cross the time limit. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ajram. You did a wonderful job and you did thank not you. cross the time limit. We have time. In fact, I can get this working, keep my finger up there. I have a few questions for you and Igor, don't go away because I have a few for you as well. Um, so I was on one question, do these sensors monitor the axial and radial clearance of the turbine? Well, we use them uh, for both. So we actually use the, the sensor, but let me just skip to that slide. So, you, uh, so uh, in this particular case, we use them in, in multiple locations. We use them like here, Actually, there is no bearing below here. It is above, but we use them anyway to see how the thing, how the shaft is moving. So you can see them here measuring in radial direction, 190 degrees, if you can see that. And then here we use them, you know, uh, to measure the movement of the flange with when, with the water intake and with the in, with the axial forces from coming from the from the load. And also we use them here, as you can see on the on the on the flywheel. So the flywheel is here. This is basically the flywheel. So we measured in radial direction on the flywheel. We also measured in axial direction on the flywheel. So yeah, I guess the answer is uh, we use them. Anyway, we could find to try to figure out how the actual unit was shaking, moving, and trying to figure out why. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, another question, stiffening a unit in resonance is based on the model shape of the natural frequency. This yeah. would look like a cantilever type model. Any reason why they stiffen the bottom, which is most likely close to the node? Yes, uh, we did uh, found that out at the beginning. We also, uh, when we first came there, that, that, that there was, diff it was the, the easiest thing to do, you know. It probably some results could be used, some uh, good uh, things could, uh, but it was just no, no construction could be made such in such a way easy, you know, to to stiffen the, the top of the generator too. When we found out that there was a problem below below the spiral, we kind of tried to focus uh, focus uh, there and see where the uh, uh, concrete injection would get us, and it got us uh, uh, in a good enough vibrational state that we were happy with, and uh, and the co commission guys were happy with, and the power plant guys guys were happy with. But yes. Probably it could be done, but not, not in this case. But very difficult to 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 make a proper proper uh, proper uh, construction. And the problem was was definitely below below the spiral. So some, we had to fix that. Uh, so we had to fix that first. And since we got good enough results, we didn't go any further with that. Okay, very good. Thank you. One more quick one before I go to a couple for Igor, and I may come back. Was there a critical speed and a structural natural frequency or just a critical speed? Well, it's basically a, a, a structural natural frequency, actually. I call it critical speed. So my, might be the bad choice of words, not like with the turbo when the shaft bends and everything, but it's it's a resonance uh, uh, frequency of the, of the construction. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Igor, a question for you. Uh, do, genera do, genera do, do generators need online partial discharge monitoring systems? Uh, definitely, it does help to um, look at the trends much more often, right? So we can not only like when we go with the PDA4, let's say with the portable testing equipment, we take uh, like the reading at, uh, let's say one particular condition, right? But when condition change, we are not able to, but 
when the periodic condition change, we are not able to. But when when we do uh, use continuous online monitor, we can track uh, uh, the partial discharge activity over the whole range of operating conditions that may really help us to determine uh, the, like the failure mechanism. Okay, good. And another question for you, Igor. Uh, Igor, excuse me. Um, partial discharge monitoring sends an alarm when the unit is at standstill. If there's a problem with the capacitors, the wiring or the monitor, I guess will the power, power monitor do that? Well, um, if I understand I, the question, yeah, let me try it again. If I understand the question, okay. say it again, please. Okay. I think the question is, will partial discharge monitoring send an alarm when the unit is at standstill? If there's a problem with the capacitors, the wiring, or the monitor? Um, no, actually, uh, there is no kind of feature to send an alarm when it stands still. And even if the unit is running, um, uh, so we do have a smart signal um, that uh, can send us an alarm if the partial discharge level goes higher than uh, the, the set point. And this is very helpful. I'm actually getting an email when, of course, we set up that, that, um, uh, the set points, right? And smart signal send us information about if it succeeded or not. But there is no uh, kind of that feature to, uh, at, at uh, and we don't actually need it at standstill because at standstill, there is no voltage on the machine and, and there is no partial discharge. Uh, one more question here for you, quick, Igor. How do you measure ozone level inside the generator enclosure and what ozone level is of a concern? Uh, yes, ozone level is kind of a uh, concern and big concern. We measure uh, with portable electronic uh, testing equipment. Uh, in our case, we use uh, 2B technologies uh, instrument um, that have uh, built in a small pump in it. And it's kind of tube goes to the sensor and we put a sensor in front of their cooler and cooler and uh, that small, small pump sucks air. Or oh, I, I mean the gas, like what we are testing, but it's kind of air, right, with ozone in it, and uh, analyze it and provide us um, like with the readings. But um, this, um, the question is, I, I want to raise like very important point that when we do ozone measurements, it's kind of give us average. So QM's levels like a maximum partial jet activity occurring at the certain location. But ozone monitoring give us average level of ozone in the like giant enclosure, let's say, or from one red. So it, it shall not mislead us if ozone level is um, moderate or low, that no PD is occurring. So at that particular location, the QM is like 4,000 millivolts that fairly can occur, but ozone level in the in, inside the enclosure can be much, much uh, like lower than the level of concern. So like to me, measuring ozone is important. But at the same time, we have to keep in mind that it's not actually giving us the condition of that partial jet in, 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 in one spot where it can fail. Very good. Um, Igor and Ozan, I want to thank you two very, very much for your presentations. They were fantastic, very interesting. The information provided is, is extremely helpful. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, I did have a few more questions, but I do want to thank you. And I hope that uh, we'll be able to see you out in uh, Spokane this summer. So with that, Elizabeth, thank you as well for providing this opportunity for us to share information since we didn't get together last year. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you, Mike, I really appreciate it. Thanks to Mike, Igor and Osrin, all three for sharing their expertise and thoughts with us. I think I could sit on this for quite some time longer and I don't know much about the subject at all. So I think it's been really great information for our audience. I wanna thank also Hydro Component Systems and Mesa Associates for sponsoring this session. And I do wanna let our audience know that a certificate of attendance will be emailed to you no later than March 23rd. Remember, in addition, this session was recorded and it will be available on demand on this platform within 24 hours. So if you have a colleague you wanna share it with um, who, could value, who would benefit from this valuable information, then absolutely you can send them to the platform and they can access this presentation very quickly. Please join us next month for our special three-day Hydro Plus program, Around the World with Hydro, which runs April 20th to 22nd and offers more than a dozen educational sessions. So that's going to be an exciting three-day program. And remember, we'll be holding our annual High Division International event live and in person July 27th to 29th in Spokane, Washington in the U.S. 
to mark your calendars and prepare to join us. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Yeah.